So with the concept of fraternism as it is, why do you think humans evolved to, to need to eat? Um, how the heck do I know? Um, I think it's something that was, you know, obviously, you know, since the dawn of time, that's something that has been a practice uh, for whatever reason, in whatever situation. But I can tell you now why people eat. Um, and it's purely, as extreme as this may sound, it's purely entertainment. And it's purely because we want to. Simple as that. I could, and I'm a champion for doing so, I can blame the food industry, I can blame this, blame that, all I want to. But at the end of the day, it's down to us as consumers, as human beings, um, to make a choice for one, uh, to take action, and it's down to uh, us to follow our own intuition and try and break the cycle of addiction and emotional attachment. So at the end of the day, to me, the, the, the reason why people eat is simply because they want to. There's various emotional reasons, um, you know, comfort eating. I mean, you, you, you've only got to look at the story of most obese people, um, morbidly obese people. And when you trace it back, there's always some kind of trauma at the root cause, you know. Um, so to answer the question, that's pretty much why I feel that we eat. Plus there's elements, you know, uh, the, food, the food industry plays its part. Various ingredients, uh, economics, um, you know, once you have m once money gets in the game, you know things change. People want to people want to create a reason for you to come back for more. Um, you know, making tempting tempting cooked treats, uh, putting in sh sugar, salt, and everything when there's really no reason to. Um, you know, so there's various things feeding, pardon the pun, feeding off each other to create a cycle. So when you talk about choice, do you think that we really do have a choice as to when we eat or what we eat? Or? To be honest, no, what, no. <laughs> not at all. We have no choice whatsoever, no conscious choice anyway. Um, when I say it's up to us to make a choice, it's pretty much you have to decide whether to be a warrior or not. Whether you want to go through the trials and torments of breaking the cycle, of almost being like a crack addict, trying to break the addiction for no reason. Um, I always say it's hard for an addict to break the cycle while they're in the cycle. There has to be something to uh, warrant the effort involved, you know, because nobody wants to go through all the withdrawal symptoms, um, especially if they've been through it once already. So, and any any addict, alcoholic, uh, drug addict will vouch for that. You know, it's not it's not a nice process to go through. So, um, I feel that with you've only got to look in the kitchens. You've you know, in the, in the fridges, in the uh, cabinets, spice racks. You know, the kitchen is like a laboratory. You mix all these ingredients together to create a taste. Uh, it's done worldwide. And a lot of uh, products, uh, a lot of the food that people eat, it's evolved into a fine art, it really has. And the art is to get you to buy more, to, to cater to your pleasure senses. And uh, it's, it's, it's turned into a form of greed, as it were, if you really you know, look into it. Um, so, no, we really don't have a choice because uh, the sources of where we get the food from, uh, which most of the time is the food industry, 
they're making it pretty uh, hard to have a choice, to, to have a conscious choice uh, with, with, what, with what they make. You know, they mar there's a marketing, you know, they market to children, they market to, um, you know, with the blue ketchup, blue sodas, green sodas, all kinds of different ketchups and sodas. And you want to look at chips, crisps. Uh, it's one crisp, but it is hundreds of different flavors for the same crisp or chip if you're in America. Uh, soy is the same thing. One product, soy or tofu, one product, but you have soy ice cream, soy cheese, soy chicken, soy bacon, soy beef, everything under the sun that, that, that they can flavor it as, you have it. Um, the cooking process is still the same, but you have different flavors. So, is it healthier? I don't know, but uh, because you know the cooking process is a cooking process, it's destructive no matter how, how you want to dress it up. But, um, but no, I, there, I really do not believe that we have a choice. And one of the main reasons why I say that is obese people. I always go back to obese people. Uh, you know, there's so much, we're fighting a losing battle with sickness and disease and obesity. Now, if there was a choice, people would have been able to make that choice far earlier. Because do you really think that people would, would consciously allow themselves to get to morbidly obese, to where they're weighing three, four hundred pounds? You know? So, so how does that happen? How do they get to that point? Because, uh, well, there's actually there's numerous scientific studies that will say uh, confirm that eating a lot of these foods is like uh, taking drugs so there is that addiction that emotional attachment there is that uh, manipulating the brain into thinking it's okay into thinking that you no know, you've not had enough just keep going you know so um, that's why I say there is no choice. There is no choice. It's like an addiction. It's, it's very much like, in my opinion, like an addiction, like an emotional attachment. Because it's from birth. Even before, when we were in our mother's womb, our mother ate cooked food. So we got cooked food. We got the same food she ate. So in, in a sense, we're like crack babies. You know, where it's just, it's that deep. It is that deep. So yeah, to me, we have, we have absolutely no choice. But what about the nutrition aspect? Like people say we need to eat because of nutrition. If it was nutrition, then again, these obese people would be the healthiest people on the planet. They'd be eating themselves healthy. They'd be able to leap tall buildings. In fact, they'd be, they'd be to coin a phrase, over healthy, they'll be superhuman, but they're not. They're fighting sickness and disease, they're uh, fighting mental illness, a lot of them, um, and the root cause is some kind of trauma and the developing destructive effects of the food they're eating in the amounts that they're eating it in. Maybe not, you know, huge amounts in one sitting, but the quantity over a period of time um, of, of, of what they're, they're eating. Um, we're, not, we're not taught to be conscious of what we're putting into our bodies. Um, because it's, f for me, doing what I do, being a Breatharian, an idiot, it's clear that there's cause and effect and we're not taught to realize or uh, pay attention to our body's signals when cause and effect comes into play. Um, we're taught that what we do is we go to the doctor and we get some pills and the pills sort it out so we can continue to eat the things that are causing us distress in the first place. So while we're taking these pills, 
Our bodies, it's like an endless fight, to and fro, a tug of war. Um, so really, if food was here for nutrition, um, obese people, just for just one example, would be superhuman. Absolutely superhuman, tip top, the healthiest people on the face of the earth. Uh, where instead it's, it's, it's the reverse. So would you say that food isn't all it's cracked up to be? Heck no. <laughs> it's not. Because, you know, we're taught, I remember when I was a kid, we were taught that, you know, milk, meat, you had to eat those things and drink those things to be healthy and strong. Mm -hmm. You had the posters, you had the propaganda, you had the promotion of all of these things. You had to eat a certain amount of meals a day um, to be fit and healthy, fit and strong. Uh, you know, you had the, the, the picture of the muscle man, you know, uh, with associated with meat. And even now, the way they market burgers, you know, it's the whole manly thing. You're not a man unless you, you can eat burgers. I mean, unless you can eat meat, and if you don't eat meat, then you're not a man, you're not a real man. So we've had, we've, you know, we've, we've, we've been told all these things, and like I say, we're fighting a, a losing battle after all these years of existence of eating these foods. Look at the state of the human uh, society, hospitals, big pharmacy doing big business of our sickness and disease, you know? They're relying on us being sick for their business. Can you imagine that? And it's like, uh, it's like when you take your car to a garage and you hear these stories about when you take your car to a garage, they might fix what's wrong with it, but they'll make sure that they leave something else wrong with it, so you come back to the garage again. It's, it's, that's kind of like what uh, our, our society and the use of food, you know, you eat, you get sick, you rely on the doctor, big pharmacy, pills, um, to get you well again, or to mask the symptom, and then you're off again, so you can eat, and the cycle until the body says, you know what, I'm just done, worn out, see ya, I'm out of here, and some organ goes, your liver goes, your kidneys go, something goes, and then you know, you have to have that taken out, and then we call that age, aging, aging process, it's just what happens, you know, you live, you eat, you drink, you party hard, you die, you know, in between that you get old, you have to have all your organs taken out, and that's it, Walk, walking stick, bus pass, and that's it, you die, eventually, and that's our life, so, um, you know, I feel that that's pretty much what our expectations are of life in our society these days. Okay. So with the food that we're eating, if it's not for nutrition, then what is it for? Why are you eating it? Entertainment. Yeah. Entertain I, rem I remember when I used to eat, uh, I used to eat blindly. I didn't know, I didn't even put any thought into it at all. I just felt, you know, I wanted to eat, so I'm going to eat. I want this, so I'm going to eat that. Mm. Cool, no, you know. Um, it was only until I, I went through tearing and I used to go back and forth between uh, raw fruits and cooked foods that I started to uh, be conscious and aware of actually why I was eating. Mm. I'd be eating some cooked food you know, when I'm supposed to be fruitarian, and I'll be actually thinking while I'm eating the cooked foods, I'm not hungry, I don't need this food, I don't want this food, so why the heck am I eating it? I really want to go fruitarian, I really want to eat raw foods. So why are we eating it? So why am I eating this thing? Um, I'd still eat it, it wouldn't stop me from eating it, but I'd, I, would, I would just question, I would be more aware to question the whys. And, you know, after a while I realised, you know what, this is just comfort, for whatever reason, it's, it's instant comfort. And I, I, I grew to realize it was like, um, I, 
I was sacrificing instant comfort for long-term health. And it was almost like I was so addicted and so attached to this instant comfort that I would sacrifice my long-term health. Long, my long-term health, you know, wasn't even, it wasn't even a contest. It was like, long-term health, see ya. I'm going to get into this. Um, and it, again, it's, you know, you've got active, addictive ingredients in the food that people eat that numbs yourself down to the point where you cannot make a correct conscious decision. You know, um, it's unbelievably hard for people to get rid of products that are destructive to their mind, body and soul. It's, in theory it sounds dead easy, but in practice it is unbelievably hard because you have become an addict. And that's pretty much the, uh, the bottom line, really, when that's concerned. When it comes to why, why we eat what we eat. Do you think there is a, an ulterior motive behind the promotion of food? On occasion, yes. <laughs> On occasion, yes. I mean, you can... I don't think it was how it was originally. I don't think the original plan is to have an ulterior motive, like some conspiracy theorists might say, you know, to, yeah. the plan is to wipe out the population, a certain amount of population, yada, 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 yada. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was, that was the original plan. I think, you know, With this food thing, it is such a sensitive and difficult subject because you have so many elements. Like, for instance, you have a family environment, you know, and uh, I've got a daughter, and I know, even when I was a fruitarian, when I used to take care of my daughter, um, I, used to, I used to want to give my daughter food. Mm -hmm. It was part of my... Mm -hmm. I, 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 I want to say instinct, whether it's a, a fake instinct or just... Uh, an emotional attachment that I was enforcing on my daughter, but I wanted to give her food. It was part of the love. Mm. It was part of my duty as a father to take care of my daughter in that way, to give her food, mm. you know? Um, and in another sense, you have the person in the store, in the shop, trying to make a living trying to sell you food. And like I say, if you want people, if, if you want to sell something, you have to have a reason for people to come back. Um, I once heard a, a really interesting story years ago of, of a, a Chinese restaurant, and I think it was in China, and they had a really successful soup. Really successful soup. They had people literally queuing around the block, outside the store and around the block for this soup and it was like well why is this soup so popular this is incredible it's incredible soup and of course every, no, nobody thought they all just thought because it tastes great it tastes good turns out the uh owners or the chefs were putting crack in the, <laughs> in the soup so that's why they had the demand people queuing out of the uh restaurant so you have to have people you know, coming back for more, you have to almost guarantee that people will come back for more. Mm. Um, so you have that element. And of course you have the conspiracy theorist element, which is perfect. I mean, they're finding all kinds of antidepressants and drugs, pharmaceutical drugs in the water supply. Mm. So, you know, what? heaven knows what people are eating, people are drinking, for what reason. But at the end of the day, the universal effect is destruction to the mind, body and soul, period. That is a universal effect. Whether it's vegan, whether it's vegetarian, whether it's uncooked, um, it's, the cooking pro it's the cooking process, the refining and the processing of man-made foods that is destroying the mind, body and soul. It's totally numbing and desensitizing us as human beings, as divine human beings. Um, my belief is, one of my beliefs, and it's getting a bit conspiracy theorist here, but 
is that maybe that food has evolved uh, or the purpose of food has evolved into um, getting us as human divine human beings to forget who we actually were where we came from um, maybe maybe it was the plan all along was to introduce some kind of uh, desensitizer uh, some kind of numbing down uh, tool so that we would forget who we actually are as divine human beings as gods um, so that so yeah that's that's my you know one of my theories possibilities um, in terms of agendas and what have you because uh, I know you know once one it's, it's like getting on a roller coaster once you're on the roller coaster that's it and to me eating uh, cooked man-made foods is like getting on a roller coaster there's no stopping halfway through and saying I'm, I've got to get off it's the ride you know can you tell us a little bit more about what eating was like for you? Wow, it was emotional. Uh, very much uh, comfort eating. And it's like for me, personally, I can, I can remember it wasn't even the taste. Because, you know, after a while the taste would wear off. The taste would wear off and I would go on to stronger tasting things um, just to get that uh, sense of st stimulation or satisfaction and you can only go so far with that um, and like I say when I went through Terry and, and I was going back and forth with the cooked food like I say it, it, it it used to pass the point where it was taste, it was like there was just a trigger. There was just a trigger in my head that said, eat something cooked, eat something. It was like my brain was saying, you know what, okay, you've had your fun. You know, I've, I've let you go, go without my, my drug for, for so long, now, now it's time you feed me. Um, and I just found myself a lot of time just mindlessly filling my mouth up with mush, cooked mush, which is basically all it. And when you chewed it up mm -hmm. in your mouth, and it's just, you know, you're all chewed up, mixed up with your saliva, drink, eat, drink. It's just mush at the end of the day. And it's like when you eat, that taste is only valid for like five seconds until it's mush. And then you swallow it, and then after you swallow it, all you've got now is just mass, just waste, toxic waste at that. That's just going to rot and get acidic inside you. So, um, for me, it was just mindless, mindless eating. And I, I think that that is probably the best way I can really explain it. I mean, I heard a term used by some government. Uh, or, or some some high-profile guy that humans have, are, are, are now are just mindless eaters, useless eaters, or something like that. And to be, it sounds cruel, extremely heartless and cruel to come from somebody, but I can actually relate because mm -hmm. that, that's how I was, um, just mindless. But it was something I felt I had to do. It was something. Uh, so deeply ingrained in me that, uh, like I say, unless I developed a warrior attitude and uh, fought tooth and nail to break the cycle of, of this addiction and emotional attachment over a, a, a long period of time, I was never going to see the other side. I was never actually going to see the truth. Um, and when you do, you do see the truth, it's it's not a pretty sight because you see things for what they really are and it, it's period it's an addiction an emotional attachment it's not nutrition it's not um health um it's addiction
So then it sounds like food is a drug. Exactly. Exactly. That's how it's being used. You look at, if you look at how everything in our society revolves around food. It does. It's, 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 it's a recreational drug. It's, to me, it's no different from smoking weed. It's no different from, from cocaine. It's no different from alcohol. Because you look at most of those things. I don't know about weed. I'm sure weed must affect you in some way, shape, or form. But um, they're all destructive. Whatever it's, it's funny. Whatever we put in our bodies is destructive in some way, shape, or form. If, if not instantly, over a period of time. Um, and, that, and, that, and that's my take on it. You shouldn't... It's just food. You shouldn't kill over food. You shouldn't riot over food. You shouldn't reach a point where you would steal to buy food or steal food. You would do wrong things for food. It should never be like that. But it is. Um, and you do the same things with drugs. Like a crack addict, like a heroin addict. So if it's, if it's really like a drug where we don't really need food, then why do people starve? Because they... I can't speak for everybody, but I p can probably speak more for people that have, have attempted to go breatharian. Um, they don't have a practice. Um, they're talked into believing that you can uh, break a cycle that was in place before you was even born in either instantly or within 21 days. Um, that's one set of people. Now you have people uh, in these famine uh, stricken countries and it's pretty much the same thing. They're given food intermittently. Um, it's not the best quality food either. Um, but they're given food intermittently. Um, you have high levels of stress. Um, if you imagine you're constantly in a situation of, well, when am I going to eat again? How am I going to eat again? When's my next meal going to come from? Uh, you, you have a high level of sickness and disease already. And that's, and that's, and that's just the people in uh, famine-stricken countries. Um, and like I've always said, starvation to me is a mindset and it's, um, it's, it's, it's timing. It's timing. I mean, if you suddenly stopped eating uh, and drinking, you're going to have problems. You're going to have symptoms uh, like of what we call starvation. Um, and, and to me, that's pretty much the... The, the cause of the whole starvation thing. And it's like the people that have eating disorders and anorexia, stuff like that. It's a mindset. It's a mental illness. Um, whether it's something, something that they had before or afterwards, it's, you know, it's neither here nor there, but it's pretty much the, the, uh, the bottom line. So starvation is like a mental illness? Is it? It's a mindset, mindset. yeah. It's, it's, it's I, I guess, again, with food, it's, it can be many things, because there's so many elements. Mm. Um, you can try to connect the dots as much as you like, but there are so many elements to try and connect all the dots with, you know, because people, they do different things for different reasons. They have, it's, it's a very emotional thing when it comes to food. It's a very mental thing. Like I say, I used to eat mindlessly. Mindlessly. Even now I'm amazed, and I see it every day, just mindless eating. People see food, ah, got to eat it. You know, you see food and you taste it even before you, you uh, get it on your plate. That's how deep it is. You, 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 you envision the pleasure, it's a mind thing, you envision the pleasure even before it's on your plate, 
you just got to look at it. And sometimes you don't even have to look at it. It doesn't even have to be there. You can just think of it. Oh, yeah. And your mouth starts wetting up, you know. Um, so it's a very mental thing. So there's, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough question to answer because there's so many reasons. There's so many reasons why people would do certain things. Um, whether it's family trauma or just stress, everyday life. I can totally understand people taking drugs. I can totally understand because, you know, this, this life and the way society structured will just drive you crazy without it. Without some form of release, without something. You know, it's, it's, it's hard for me some days to, you know, be able to face life in this society with no form of... I have my music, I have my music, I, you know, I have... What do I have? Jeez. You see, I mean, you take food out of the equation and what do you have to medicate yourself with? Um, I have, like, like I say, I have music and that straight away on the top of my head has always been a big one for me. Um, I have my uh, training fitness. I try to do that as much as I can. Um, you know, and it's, and it's just looking at beautiful things. I try to look at as much beautiful things. I try to experience as many beautiful things as possible. Um, and even then, it's really... And I'll say it, because I'm not... I've got nothing to hide or nothing to prove, but I'll say it, it's hard going day by day in this society. Because it sucks. This society, I've said it many times, this society sucks. And it's hard to go, you know, day to wake up day in, day out to uh, a, a society that does such crazy things. Um, so, yeah. Um. There are people who say, that you are what you eat. Do you believe that? I used to. I used to believe that. Um, in, in, in some sense it's true. But then, you think about it this way, if I eat... If you think about it this way, if you are what you eat, I would have to eat humans mm -hmm. to survive. I would have to eat... For me to be able to cut myself and heal, I would have to eat humans. I would have to eat human skin. I would have to eat eyeballs. I would have to eat human hair. I would have to eat lips. I would have to eat all kinds of stuff. <laughs> I would have to... <laughs> Got to keep this clean, right? Keep this video clean. But anyway, I would have to eat all kinds of stuff. Um, like if I ate bread, uh, I don't suddenly become a loaf of bread. You know, so in that sense, I don't really believe that um, you are what you eat thing um, anymore. Mm. So I guess this goes back to the whole nutrition question, you know, because the body, when you eat a pizza, mm. the body doesn't know anything about nutrition when you eat a pizza. When you eat a pizza, it's because you, you, you wanted to experience the taste, mm. the texture, the medication, the self-medication of that pizza. That's why you ate that pizza. It wasn't because the body instinct intuitively said, I need nutrition, I need a pizza. Get me a pizza. Um, it wasn't, I need a glass of milk, I need the nutrition in a glass of milk, so I need a glass of milk. Because to me, that's ridiculous because you have to look at what the cooking process has left you with. Mm. In terms, if there is such nutrition in this food, mm. then you have to look at what the uh, cooking process has left you with. For all you know, the cooking process may have wiped out any and all nutrition that was ever even in that food. Mm. And then you have to ask yourself, okay, well, am I in a condition to even use or process? that nutrition and how is that nutrition being used and processed um, because to me I always say that the body functions in spite of food not because of it 
if I eat, if I eat a loaf of bread, I don't suddenly start growing bread here or pizza here. I just don't do it. I grow here. If my nails grow, but my nails don't, I don't grow pizza nails or bread nails. My nails grow. You know, if I cut my hand, blood comes out. Milk doesn't come out. Or pizza juice, oil, you know, blood comes out. So, um, it's, like, it's like I always say, the body functions in spite of food, not because of it. Um, and that's, that's something I, I, I strongly believe in. What happens to the body when we eat food? It gets all messed up. Uh, when we eat cooked food, cooked and processed foods, mm -hmm. the body sends out its white blood cells, its army, to defend itself against the invis this invader. Mm -hmm. So that alone should, should, should be an indication as to what happens to the body. The body sees it as a danger. Mm -hmm. The body sees it as a danger. The body doesn't say, mmm, great, good stuff. That's, that's, that's the mind, our addicted mind. The body, actually functioning body, says, oh, no, we can't handle that. Uh, and it sees it as a danger and it sends the white blood cells to, to battle it. Um, doesn't stand a chance. But, but the point is, is that the body sees it as a danger. Um, you know, where the... the Cooked food dehydrates the body uh, dramatically. Um, it drains basically, without going into all the science, scientific stuff, which I don't know of anyway, but without going into um, any of the, the long scientific stuff, basically the, the, it drains the body of its resources. It's like if you keep taking money out of, the, out, out of your bank pretty soon, you won't have any money in your bank account. So that's pretty much what um, cooked processed foods does for you. It doesn't give you any, it doesn't put money in your bank account. It doesn't do anything like that. Um, it always take. I always say it takes away, it always takes away. And that's how we're left with sickness and disease. Mm -hmm. We just en end up wearing ourselves down, mm -hmm. you know, drain, draining our money from our account. So with all this sickness and disease, why do we still eat? Why do we still do it? Because we're addicted, old boy. <laughs> we're addicted. Mm. We're addicted to it. And we have all these stories that we need to eat. You try, I mean, me as a breatharian, so many people hate me. So many people want to fight me, get angry at me. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I go against everything that they have been taught to be true. You're supposed to eat to live. Mm. I do talks and pe people say to me, you eat to live. You're supposed to eat to live. <laughs> You know, and it's just, it's, it's, it's pressure, it's uh, indoctrination, mm. it's conditioning. Um, like I say, addiction and emotional attachment. Um, and it's pleasure. I mean, why not? It's, it's like, you ask anybody, why do you smoke weed? Why do you, why do you take, why do you smoke crack? Why do you take crack? Why do you do heroin? Why do you do this? At the end of the day, it's pleasure. Um, you're an addict, why not? So with these addictive qualities and it being like a drug, do you think there should be a health warning on fruit? Of, oh, believe me, yes. But then again, if there was a health warning, People, especially the food in industry, already know that they can put whatever health warning they want to and people will still buy the stuff because they're addicted and they're attached to it. Mm. You could put a baby's fetus on there, uh, a, a picture of a baby's fetus on there mm. and people will still buy the product because they're addicted. You can, you can, the proof of that is any cigarette box. You, they'll show you, blatantly show you Lungs, two sets of lungs. Cancer lungs, healthy lung. Mm -hmm. And it says, smoking will, uh, can cause harm to you and others. Mm -hmm. And they have a two, 
two pictures, cancer-ridden lung and a healthy lung. Basically saying that if you smoke these, this will be your lung, the cancer-ridden lung. You need to stay with a healthy lung. But if you smoke these cigarettes, this is what you're going to get. So they'll blatantly tell you and show you what you're going to get. But people still buy the suckers. So that tells you straight away. You know, it doesn't matter what they do. If you're addicted and attached to it, you're going to feel like you need it. And you're going to buy it, regardless of what health warning, regardless of what they state. They have uh, smoking kills on cigarettes. People still buy it. They, 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 they have smoking will call, cause harm to others and you. People still buy it. So pe people don't care if children sm uh, smell it, inhale their smoke. Old people inhale their smoke. They don't care. They will still buy these products because they're addicted and emotionally attached. Period. I don't care what anybody says because that is the bottom line. If it wasn't, then people would quit. Because who wants to put children in danger? Who wants to put elderly people in danger? And more, most importantly, who wants to put themselves in danger? I've, I've, I've seen people, I've known people riddled with cancer. Get the choice. You either save yourself and stop smoking or stop drinking, or you succumb to this cancer and die. I'll keep on doing what I'm doing. You know, um, I've seen it. So, for somebody who wants to quit and then they want to get off cooked food, how long would you say it would take them to, to get off cooked food and, and go back and go breatharian? If they wanted to go breatharian, depending on where they're from, um, and this is in no way a, a me teaching anything, but really it's a lifelong practice um, now the definitions of breatharianism have always been set by skeptics that have had no understanding no empathy um, and there's never been any room for growth so um, unfortunately people that have wanted to go breatharian they have adopted the definitions of the skeptics and that's pretty much the reason why people have been getting into hospital and um, dying even um, because they've been taking false information um, for people that want to really break the cycle of this addiction and emotional attachment they need to realize that it's a lengthy process um, I recommend 15 years um, to fully, if you're really serious about doing it, fully transition and not just do it for a couple of weeks and then decide to go back to, you know, cook foods. If you're really serious about successfully, permanently doing it, then 15 years, you should be willing to invest 15 years to transitioning. Say like uh, five years vegan, five years fruitarian, five years liquidarian. To, to consistently, slowly evolving uh, to full uh, in media, Um Again, with uh, medical supervision. Um, that's, that's basically my take on that and my recommendation. Because there's too many people, they want instant you know, they hear all these stories about, well, I did it in one day, I just decided not to eat, I just woke up one day, it didn't make sense, I decided not to eat, and that was it. Um, like I always say, there, there was always something. It was never you just woke up and you decided to change. There was always some process, whether it's mental or physical, going on prior to you making that choice. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, that's pretty much my recommendation on that and how I see the, you know, the length, I mean, how long is a piece of string? But that's my recommendation for, for people to realize that it's a lifelong commitment to staying clean. It's like any alcoholic, it's like any uh, drug abuser. It's a commitment to staying clean, a lifelong commitment.
hunger really exist? That's a big question. Um, in my eyes, no, when you really look at it. It's like, uh, if you take the addiction of a crack addict, the need, the addiction, and if you change the addiction from crack to food, it's the same thing, in my eyes. Um, the whole stomach growling thing, to me, that's just your waste, your body trying to get rid of your waste. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, but what we do is we've been told, we've been conditioned to believe that that is hunger. That sensation is hunger. Your addiction is hunger. And it's hunger for nutrition. But like I say, your body doesn't know anything about nutrition. It doesn't know anything about vitamin A, vitamin B, yada, yada, yada. Because um, in, in my opinion, the body is already attempting to recycle, it's already attempting to use what you're taking from the environment. Um, so basically, yeah, you know, if that sense of hunger that we feel are two different things, it's addiction and it's your body trying to get rid of the waste, but what do we do? We feel the hunger thing, we put more, we put more down there, you know? Um, so it's, and, and that's the cycle I'm talking about. The cycle is it's, it's basically a cycle of understanding. And, and, and like I say, unless you break that cycle with a warrior attitude, then you're never going to really see the truth. And you'll just keep feeding that cycle. So to me, no, there's no real such thing as uh, hunger at all. Um, I think the closest thing to, hu to hunger to me is the healing process that you're going to go through during transition where you need to hydrate yourself. So to me the closest thing to hunger is, quite, is often, well in my experience as a, as a fruitarian and liquidarian, is thirst. Um, because you, you know there is a time where you need to heal. It's not just straight away, you're a breatharian or you're a fruitarian or you're this, you're that. There's a process where you have to heal. And once you've healed, then you can be successful at whatever lifestyle you're attempting. Until you heal, you're going to have to go through that healing process. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much my take on the whole uh, hunger, hunger thing. Who do you feel has set the definition for breatharianism? Oh man, you've only got to look on the internet, uh, Google Breatharianism, and you'll have uh, definitions come up, and they're all by skeptics. And like I say, they're, they're, they're done by skeptics, and why on earth are they even writing about this, setting definitions, going on Wikipedia, and setting definitions for breatharianism when they believe that it's impossible. Why are these people doing it in the first place? But that's another story. Um, so they're setting the definitions and unfortunately because of the lack of information, um, people that are genuinely uh, wanting to be breatharians are adopting, unknowingly adopting those definitions and trying to transition via those definitions. And it's, it's, it's crazy because they're getting themselves in trouble. The pressure, because there's no, um, en because of the negative energy in those definitions, that's what these people are, are experiencing. And that's why they're ending up in hospitals. That's why they're ending up dead. Because they're, they're, they're trying to live up to um, unrealistic definitions. Um, it's a, such a sad thing, and I'm disgusted because not one high-profile breatharian, I mean, you'll even see these definitions set by the high-profile breatharians. So I wonder what they're up to. You have no, there has been no high-profile breatharian that has set real definitions. None, not one of them. And to me that is disgusting because there's people getting themselves in trouble, getting hospitalized, 
dying left, right and centre. That's a big thing to say, left, right and centre. But if people are getting hospitalised left, right and centre because of this. And it needs to stop. It really does need to stop. There needs to be some kind of guidelines set. Um, you know, things like Wikipedia, I wouldn't expect to see anybody, anybody in their right mind even bothering with that, trying to reset that. Um, because, you know, I've seen it happen myself. A skeptic will just come in. Within five minutes, they'll have their definitions back up. Because you can rewrite those things in no time at all. Um, but on, on Breferian sites, uh, high-profile Breferian sites, I don't see any definition of what Breferianism truly is. And uh, I, that, that totally disgusts me. Um, with, with my immediate society, I'm actually, or I have actually drafted up defin new definitions, realistic definitions, um, and safety guidelines for people to work with, for people to look at. Um, and, you know, those will be up shortly for public view. Um, but, but it's, I'm so, uh, you know what, I'll say, I'm pissed off, but it had to be me. And not a high-profile high Breferian. Because me, I'm nothing, I'm nobody. Um, so it shouldn't be me. It should be these high-profile Breferians that are selling the books, that are making the money, that have got, that have got the, the, the public's attention, not me. Because I have to work six times harder, because nobody knows me, nobody wants to know me. I've, I'm, who am I? So, uh, you know, <laughs> it's just more work for me. But, but yeah, it's the skeptics. They are, they are the ones that have, that have made up these definitions for people to follow. Whether it was their intentions for people to follow or whether they felt they were doing the world a service by uh, telling people what Breferianism is or their opinion of what Breferianism is. But unfortunately, it's, it's, it's meant that, you know, people have taken those definitions to heart um, and they've ended up harmed. So there needs to be more accountability? Oh, heck yeah. Yes. So much more accountability. I can't, it's it, gone over days now where it's just like, you know, uh, behind closed doors, homemade, do it yourself, do it yourself preferingism. You, you know, where it's just rumours and hearsay. There has to be some structure. You, you, you go to Alcoholics Anonymous. They have a 12 steps program. You go to any drug uh, rehabilitation centre. They have steps in place. They have structure. It, the same thing needs to be done with people that uh, want to fast whether it be spiritual reasons, or whether it, for it be te temporary, because there's no rule book, there's nothing in the rules that say Breferianism has to be forever. That's a, that, that's a skeptic thing, that's a skeptic uh, definition right there, that it has to be forever, you never eat or drink again. That's, there's nothing in any rule books that say that. Um, so, so for whatever reason, um, you know, there, there needs to be some kind of safety guidelines. Um, and like I said, I've, I've, I've already written up, drafted up safety guidelines, new definitions, and they'll be available shortly for people to see. What do you say to someone who asks you, how long do you think it takes to go for dairy? Fifteen years. I'm recommending fifteen years. Mm. No more, no, n none of this free week stuff. To me, it takes three weeks to get an understanding of the fact that it's a long-term commitment. You know, you, you, you're not going to... If you want to do it permanently, if you, if you want to stop messing around, none of this going back and forth, temporary, you know, oh, back and forth, getting eating disorders, getting developing a mental illness, uh, getting crap from society, you know, because they, they can see you going back and forth, they can see you in a state, they can see you looking terrible, and you don't know, you haven't got a clue what you're doing, you haven't got no comeback for them, you know. Um, if you want to do a, 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 
a permanent transition, it's got to be slow and it's got to be gradual and it's got to be an evolution if you want to be successful. So I'm, I'm recommending 15, at least 15 years. How long did it take you? It took me 16. I would like to actually say it took me all my life to get to this point. Um, but from the time I was fruitarian to now, it's roughly 16 years. And, um, you know, I'm not saying it based on my own experience either. The, the 15 year thing is actually um, something I've read before and I strongly, it strongly resonated with me because the body has to have time to adjust mentally and physically. It's not going to do that within three weeks. It's not going to adjust and adapt in three weeks and that's it. You're a successful breatharian, you've graduated and that's it. You're a breatharian forevermore. Mm -mm. It's not working like that for most people. I won't say all because I don't know all. But for most people, it's, it's definitely not working that way. Um, because it may work that way for you once you're in the company of your guru. You, you know, once you're all emotionally involved and invested in the guru, in what the guru's saying. But as soon as you get back to your own life, your own, the fridge, the cupboard, <laughs> stress, the children, the husband, the wife, relatives, you know, society, that crap, the, the crap that society brings, everything falls apart. So it's, it's got to be a gradual and um, slow process. So how can somebody even begin to transition if it's, it's going to take 15 years? Slowly. Yeah. Slowly, yeah. People just need to get it in their heads. People need to get it in their heads. It's not a quick fix. It's not um, it's a lifetime commitment, period. Um, people need to stop looking for the quick fix. They need to stop looking for the gurus, um, looking for, for, for people to give them that quick fix. They need to be prepared to put the work in themselves because that's the way they're going to learn. That's the way they're going to develop their own truth is if they put the work in themselves. People can look at me look at my history, I mean I'll look at my videos on YouTube and you can see my history. I've had to work and put the work in myself over years. I'll, I will tell you here and now I messed up so many times. I quit and I went back and forth. I quit. There ain't nothing special about me, you know. Um, so people need to get it in their heads. It's a, it's a, it's a, a lifelong commitment. And I learned so many things from messing up. I learnt my trade from messing up. I'm so glad I messed up. Um, so yeah, pe people really do need to get it into their heads that it's a lifelong commitment. You know, like I say, depending on where you're starting from, maybe five years vegan, maybe five years fruitarian, and then five years liquidarian, and then see your and reevaluate after that. Um, and you'll see it's so much more safer. There's no not as much pressure. You know, you've got to allow yourself these, these, these mess-ups. You don't learn anything by being perfect straight away. Nothing whatsoever. Everything I've learned wasn't learned because I knew how to do it already. It was learned because I messed up. I had to learn. I had to figure things out. I had to listen to my intuition. I had to discover my intuition. Um, you know. What would you say to aspiring breatharians that want to learn more about this? I would say to um, go to my website, which is my YouTube channel, um, immediatesociety.com. Um, and because I don't talk to people, it's one of my things now, it's one of my safety guidelines now. I don't, I don't talk to people unless they've, unless I know that they're seeking medical attention, medical help, um, unless I can uh, contact their medical help, if they can give me a reference. Um, otherwise, I'm not, I'm not contacting people 
or communicating with people. Because like, I, like I've always said, there's a lot of crazy people around. There's a lot of uh, do-it-yourself referians. Um, you know, so no more of that. I'm, they've always scared me. So no more of that. Um, like I say, so it's about time we put some structure into this thing. Um, put some accountability onto these people. They're not just going to uh, contact me and expect me to spoon feed them information. Um, so, yeah, if, if, if you're not prepared to do all that, then you can just watch my videos. And pro probably if you're not prepared to do all that, then you're not going to be willing to watch my boring videos, because my videos are like about three hours long, each one, so it takes some commitment. There are people who, are, who say that we have organs for a reason. And most people would say that. So what do you say to those people? Our organs weren't designed or made for digesting, uh, in my opinion, digesting man-made foods. Um, I believe what we have may have adapted to serve a purpose in terms of making it easier to get rid of the waste that, are, that is constantly in us. Who do you feel has set the definitions for breakaganism? Oh man, you've only got to look on the internet, uh, Google breakaganism, and you'll have uh, definitions come up, and they're all by skeptics. Mm. And like I say, they're, they're they're done by skeptics, and why on earth are they even writing about this? Setting definitions, going on Wikipedia and setting definitions for breatharianism when they believe that it's impossible. Why are these people doing it in the first place? But that's another story. Um, so they're setting the definitions, and unfortunately because of the lack of information, um, people that are genuinely uh, wanting to be breatharians are adopting, unknowingly adopting those definitions and trying to transition via those definitions. And it's, it's, it's crazy because they're getting themselves in trouble. The pressure, because there's no, um, because of the negative energy in those definitions, that's what these people are, are like, experiencing and that's why they're ending up in hospitals that's why they're ending up dead because they're 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 trying to live up to um unrealistic definitions um it's a, such a sad thing and i'm disgusted because not one high profile breatharian i mean you'll even see these definitions set by the high profile breatharians so i wonder what they're up to you have no, there has been no high profile breatharian that has set real definitions. None, not one of them. And to me that is disgusting because there's people getting themselves in trouble, getting hospitalized, dying, left, right and center. That's a big thing to say, left, right and center. But people are getting hospitalized, left, right and center because of this. And it needs to stop. It really does need to stop. There needs to be some kind of guidelines set. Um, you know, things like Wikipedia, I wouldn't expect to see.